Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, campus minister and assistant professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. I find that from a lot of different sources we have this idea coming that we really shouldn't talk about sin at all. And I might just uh, complete that picture by saying it seems as though theology went in that same direction. There was a time when religious educators, it seemed, didn't want to talk about sin. They wanted kids to feel good about themselves. So they would speak of grace and triumph and resurrection and God's help and so on with very little realistic talk about the possibilities of, of sin entering into one's life. Joining Father Basic in today's Reflections is Dr. Roman Carrick, the Director of the Counseling and Career Development Center at Bowling Green State University. Today's Reflections focuses on the topic of personal sin. Here's Father Basic. Roman, over the years, you and I have had many interesting conversations. Uh, I have uh, found a great deal of enlightenment and encouragement from you as a friend and as a professional counselor over the years, and so I'm happy for us to sort of extend our serious conversation into this setting. Are you comfortable with that? Yes, I think so. Uh, I've gained a lot from our conversations, Jim, and I'm happy to be here with you. Okay, so let's uh, turn to uh, the topic of uh, personal sin. Whenever you say that word sin, some people uh, want to turn it off right away and think that that's too heavy a topic or that in this enlightened age that people should not be sitting around talking about sin anymore. And yet, uh, I think it is vitally important that we do so and that we begin to... Uh, try to uh, deal with this idea that people think that it is passe because there are some people in the culture who believe that all of that talk of sin will simply produce negative feelings about ourselves that there was an idea that uh, Christianity as it was presented was too heavy and moralistic that there was a lot of this preaching of hell and so on gave people bad self images and that we really needed to get away from that, that it was an unhealthy situation. And in a world come of age, where we now know better and where science is helping us to deal with the world, that we, we really don't need that talk of sin anymore. And I suppose one uh, field uh, that really played into this was your own, that of psychology. So psychology was able to tell us about the distortions in human nature. Freud would help us understand uh, some of the dark forces within us. The field of psychology would, uh, at least in the past, used to speak of neurosis and uh, sort of dysfunctions of our personality. And, it was a and we were able to, in one way or another, to say that, well, I'm not responsible for these things. I'm programmed in this way. I notice a new book out now called The Selfish Gene, I think by Professor Wilson, if I'm not mistaken, who... Uh, talks about the fact that we are programmed to be selfish today. In other words, it isn't our fault, but it is just a genetic matter that we function selfishly because that's the way we have survived as a species. And then I also think of the world of sociology that has as well uh, told us to put aside the notion of sin, that the sociologists might claim that, well, it is the structures in which we live, the injustice that prevails in our institutions, the deprivations that we know as we grow up and so on. I always think of that uh, line from West Side Story that where the, the young person says, well, I'm depraved on account I was deprived. There was that whole idea that one is deprived in childhood or lives in a difficult situation and therefore one is depraved or one doesn't turn out right. One isn't responsible for that according to this mentality. It just is programmed by the society in which we live. So I find that from a lot of different sources we have this idea coming that we really shouldn't talk about sin at all. And I might just uh, complete that picture by saying it seems as though theology went in that same direction. There was a time when religious educators, it seemed, didn't want to talk about sin. They wanted kids to feel good about themselves. 
so they would speak of grace and triumph and resurrection and God's help and so on with very little realistic talk about the possibilities of, of sin entering into one's life. So maybe from at least those three different sources, we have this well, psychology, sociology, and theology. We've had this idea of sin put into a zone of silence, or at least advocates uh, of that position saying, let's not hear of sin anymore. Let's banish that entirely. Maybe what we ought to do is bring both of those uh, extremes together and see how they sort of fit together. On the one hand, feeling that I'm not responsible for anything then lets me do anything and I don't have any personal responsibility for it. I can do pretty much anything that I want to do. On the other hand, if I'm responsible for every single thing that I do wholly and entirely, then that's kind of burdensome also. I think that there are that there's sort of a happy medium between these two. That there are a lot of influences that do affect the way I behave or the way other people behave. But yet at the same time, despite those influences, I still have a choice in the matter of what I want to do or what I don't want to do. It seems like that uh, really puts us in a healthier position, doesn't it? I, I really agree with that. That I mean, there's some sense in which I have to take responsibility for my life, or at least the attitudes I take up towards all of the determinations that I find in my life. And that when I'm able to do that, it seems like I, I live in a healthier way, really. And uh, therefore, I mean, it would be one of the, you suggest it as sort of a, a middle ground here, or getting both ideas in there. I guess... I always want to fight for freedom of the individual. And I have to go back to Skinner's book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, where he wants to say that all the talk of freedom simply takes us away from the task of shaping the environment so that we could program human behavior. I think he says at the end, of the last chapter of that book, that human beings are nothing but a bundle of responses to stimuli, that we're more like Pavlov's dogs than Shakespeare's angels. And I think that uh, I really uh, need to fight against that. I mean, that would undercut our whole Christian understanding of the world and I think flies in the face of our common experience that indeed we do function as free creatures. On the other hand, I'm sure there is a lot of determinism in our lives. And I, I take it you wanted to make that point. There's a lot of ways in which forces impinge on us or force us to act in a particular way. Uh, my own mentor, Carl Rahner, liked to say that no matter what, how you could show that we are determined, that still we have the ability to take up an attitude towards that. Even if we are in prison, we can take up an attitude towards that, either to be totally negative about it or try to find some good or positive thing about it. Uh, what is Sartre one time said that he never felt freer than during the Nazi occupation and while they were fighting with the resistance. He said Frenchmen were never freer than during that resistance period because they were co under coercion and uh, they were in fear of their lives often, but it seemed to galvanize their activity and move them to a heightened consciousness and, and indeed to very constructive behavior. So I guess uh, somehow I, uh, in whenever we start to talk about sin, there seems to be the need to make sure we safeguard human freedom because if we're not responsible for ourselves and if nothing we ever do is blameworthy, then uh, we cannot be held accountable, but we also can't be rewarded for what we do that's good. And mm -hmm. we can't think positively, I think, about our own life and being able to grow and develop because of our free choices. Yes, I think if I'm not responsible for anything, then when I do something, I can always use the statement, well, that's just the way I am. Yeah, that's right. just the way things are. Uh, I can't help it because my mother did this to me or my father did this or everybody else is doing something to me. I guess uh, those of us who counsel run into that, right? I mean, people who just oh, yes. take that out. Mm -hmm. It's easy always to blame somebody else. Whereas, on the other hand, uh, I think there are these, like you say, despite social influences and just my physical limitations sometimes, I still can make choices, even though at times that's going to be difficult. I think in, in the counseling situation, uh, I, I think of an example uh, that comes up from uh, the number of people that I have talked with over the past years. And I think particularly of a, a young lady who was uh, very troubled and uh, originally, I think, came in with uh, nightmares, feeling very troubled, very concerned 
uh, waking up in the middle of the night uh, screaming, uh, constantly being worried about something happening to her folks back home. And in the course of discussing uh, what was happening with this young lady, uh, she suddenly said, I wonder if all of these sorts of things have anything to do with uh, an abortion that I had uh, two months ago. And we started to talk about that issue, and the more she talked about that issue, the more she seemed to be describing like uh, she did something that was against her values. And everybody in her life had been telling her to forget about it. It's okay. That's the only thing she possibly could have done. Uh, that's the only reasonable thing that she should have done. And as I reflected back to her what, was, what she was telling me, and I mentioned to her that it sounded like she really felt like she had done something against her values and, in fact, had uh, almost taken a life that she shouldn't have taken is the way she was describing it. She looked me in the eye and she said to me, nobody has ever said that to me before, but that's exactly the way I feel. And then she broke down crying and started to accuse herself and talk about herself as though she could never be forgiven. This young lady had no religious upbringing, yet there was that sense within her that she did something that wasn't right even though there were tremendous amount of forces operating against her. And indeed, she probably had very little guilt, I would suspect, I mean, very little culpability mm -hmm. in the matter because of the tremendous pressures that were on her. And yet, she knew that she made a choice. And she was looking upon this, I think, as a personal kind of sin that she committed. And she was not going to forgive herself for it. That's um, that's a f uh, powerful story, isn't it? And it really represents, in a graphic way, the kind of thing we're talking about. I guess about the the troubles that come when we are not able to admit personal sinfulness. I I'm thinking right now of Carl Menninger's famous book, Whatever Became of Sin, where Menninger uh, points out to us the great difficulties that occur in the culture as a whole. And for us as individuals, when we fail to take responsibility for our lives and admit our sinfulness and our individual sins. I mean, his thesis is that, of course, that uh, anx a vague anxiety comes upon us when we're not able to admit our own responsibility, that much of the culture lives with this black cloud over it, a vague uh, sort of disquiet, is precisely because we have not... Uh, properly been able to accept our culpable and blameworthy actions. And I think a manager in that book castigates the clergy as well for not talking about sin. In other words, out of his psychological framework, he sees that many people are damaged because they are not able to admit their culpability. And he calls upon the clergy to begin to talk about sin in a new way and to reintroduce it into our vocabulary and into our sermons, not just in terms of the hellfire type sermons, but the, the need to admit this personal responsibility. And I couldn't help think of that as you were recounting your story, because unless you had verbalized for the young woman uh, this precise feeling of culpability, uh, then she probably wouldn't have been able to touch that. I, I could imagine her coming to a, a priest, for example, or a minister or a religious person who was into this more optimistic outlook and who would be sitting there telling her, well, you're okay, that's all right, don't worry about it, you know, forget it, put it uh, behind you and so on, and who probably would have never helped her. I think that, that because the, the whole idea of sin wouldn't have been brought forth, in other words, we as priests or people of the gospel or theologians could fail here. In other words, I'm taking manager's criticism uh, seriously. I think when people come into us and want to talk about the deep sense of sinfulness, if we just tell them, well, that's all right, then they know that we don't know. They know that we're not in touch with what they're really feeling. And indeed, I think we don't end up seeing them anymore. They might say, well, she's a nice sister or he's a nice minister or priest, but he doesn't feel my problem. And what I get out of your story is that you really zeroed in on 
the flaw or the the culpability the re sense of responsibility and gave her words for that which i think is precisely what manager was calling upon uh, the culture as a whole to do and the uh, clergy people in particular yes i think that example that i gave you is probably the clearest example that i can think of of the number of people that i've talked to where this was really really clear cut I think many times, though, people come in to counseling and they're accusing themselves of all kinds of sins when indeed they're not, and that that also gets them mixed up. And I think uh, some of the upbringing that we have had, uh, maybe as Christians, uh, at least from a, a more classical viewpoint, has sort of reinforced that thing, that everything is selfishness, and yet we are asked to really love ourselves and commanded to do so. And that that can be used as sort of uh, a manipulative device to get an individual to do anything that another person wants them to do if they are convinced that being selfish is, is a terrible thing at all times and all places. I mean, even parents and teachers could use that as a device. Like, yes. don't do that because that's selfish, or do yes. this because that's the loving thing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever run yeah, into anything Yeah, that's an interesting like thing. That. Yeah, I do think that that kind of manipulation and control goes on. And I think, interestingly enough, it goes on not just in the old classical, traditional, a heavy moralistic type of training that a lot of us knew, but I think it also happens in the new kind of uh, liberal, progressive kind of approach to religious education as well. In fact, I think it happens in more subtle ways not this God's going to damn you to hell business, but perhaps uh, calling upon, for example, freshmen in high school to be altruistic, when I think that maybe they're not capable of that. Uh, you know, in some degree they are, and I'm all for having opportunities for them to practice altruism or to be uh, kind and generous to other people. But the notion that uh, these young people are able to do that and must do it, and if they don't do it, these unselfish acts that something is wrong with them I think is a new form of this manipulation or control that you were describing mm -hmm. I think another thought that comes to my mind as we're discussing this topic is the sort of upbringing where an individual has nothing right or wrong to bounce off of uh, by that I mean uh, the important people in a in a young man's or young woman's life constantly come back with the statement uh, you choose what you think you have to do. And uh, I've known some people who have gotten into some real bad situations because of that. They experimented and they sort of followed their basic desires as to what they wanted to do, which were out of sync with uh, the social order around them. And I think sometimes we we tend to shy away from making people feel guilty or making people uh, think about sin uh, like that is going to really damage them in some way. Uh, in all of my training as a counselor, I don't ever recall anybody talking about sin. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. I think we basically talked about uh, neuroses and character disorders and uh, things that uh, people uh, could control or uh, most often what they couldn't control. Uh, I think more recently, though, there is a there is more of an emphasis on personal responsibility. You know, and I'm thinking that part of the contribution that theologians can make to this is to give the world of psychology or the culture as a whole, the people, uh, ordinary people in the pew, for example, uh, new ways of thinking about sin. I think very often it, it, the, the notions of sin in the past centered in on breaking God's law and that um, there wasn't much distinction between those laws, whether they were God's laws or the church's laws and so on, and uh, that there was often a heavy penalty connected with it and a sort of false perfectionism put in front of people as an ideal. So I would think one of the jobs of the theologian today is to try to explain to people what sin is uh, in other categories. I might just try a few of those. Now, you might think of sin, per, uh, as, a, uh, for example, a refusal to love in life or a refusal to grow. You know, one is given the opportunity to develop in some way and one settles because of fear into mediocrity or the old way of acting. We might think of uh, sin as escaping from reality. 
I, I find that to be an interesting notion, that sin is to refuse to live with the world as it really is. We could think of it as um, uh, causing disharmony to freely, culpably, in a blameworthy manner to bring separation or disharmony into the world. Uh, we could think of it as uh, on purpose hurting other human beings. I find that is a very functional way of thinking about sin. I mean, when have I sinned? It is when I have unnecessarily and freely, culpably hurt another human being. You could think of sin perhaps as a, a choosing good over e uh, or evil over good, just at a fundamental level in my life, opting for selfishness or to turn away from God. One of the biblical notions of sin is to miss the target or we put it in contemporary terms, to fail to do the very fitting thing in a given situation, the kind of thing that our conscience tells us that we're called upon to do. You might think of sin as promoting social injustice, bringing more oppression into our world, more alienation among people. Well, those are just some examples of the way we might talk about sin today that would uh, ring uh, true with people or would enable them to zero in on exactly what is wrong in their own lives. Um, I'm wondering, as I'm saying that, Roman, if any of those descriptions uh, fit in with your own uh, counseling practice or make some sense to you. The thought that was going through my mind was, why do, why do uh, we avoid the word sin? What does the word sin connote say that some of these other descriptions that you have given does not connote. I think for many of us it, it tell, speaks about a repressive training and, uh, and a scary attitude to life, a very negative approach where sin is more powerful than anything else. It makes me think of the image of the tightrope walker, as though life is like walking on a tightrope and the worst thing in the world is to fall off. You've got to always be worried whether you're going to fall off. I think it brings to mind uh, uh, sermons that people heard that scared them, uh, the, it, re, a repressive kind of training. I think that's why people don't want to talk about it. And that's why, as a theologian, I want to find better ways of saying it that don't carry though, that neurotic guilt with, uh, mm -hmm. the, with the, the notion, that has a more uh, realistic approach that says, Yes, we can make mistakes. Yes, we can sin. That is, go against our conscience. Our conscience, our best judgment, tells us to do a particular thing, and yet we go in another direction. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that, that it needs to be said. And as I'm saying that, I'm thinking, and yet that notion of personal sin is even broader, isn't it? Because it relates to um, uh, habitual things about myself. So that if I tell a lie here and then another lie there, and keep telling lies before long I am a liar before long now that is an habitual part of the way I live and now I got a real problem not just that I lied three times but that I cannot be trusted in the world I can't uh, be trusted in conversation so I think we should think about personal sin not just as individual acts but as well of patterns of conduct that enter into our lives of parts of our personality that get deformed or truncated because we have committed individual sinful actions. Mm -hmm. I think speaking about it in, in those ways would make it more acceptable to most people. I notice that in the uh, counseling that I've done at the university, sometimes students are reluctant to go and talk to a clergyman, even if it is a, a more religious kind of question, because they don't want to hear that that they're sinners, they don't want to hear that, uh, you know, pray to God and it'll be all be taken care of. It's almost like they have a sense like that's true, but there's more to it than that. Like mm -hmm. I have to do something about it. And uh, couching sin in, in those kinds of terms, I guess, is, is basically uh, changing our way of talking about it without losing any of the the basic theological sense behind it. Well, I like the way you said that, which I think is often what theologians are exactly trying to do. You know? mm -hmm. I, it was interesting comment, as you said, that in the psychological training you wouldn't have uh, used the word, the category sin, which I, one could understand because I think it is more of a theological, religious word. And yet you made a comment that that sense of personal responsibility is coming back more into the field of psychology or counseling. Didn't you say something I like that? I think especially from, say, a humanistic standpoint or, say, from the, the cognitive theorists, 
it's it's like uh, what I how I talk to myself about my life leads to certain feelings, leads to certain ways that I'm going to behave. So that there is an emphasis on my being responsible for the choices I make, my being responsible for the feelings I have. Uh, it is, like you said before, almost choosing mm -hmm. to feel a certain way about things. And I think some of the counseling that I do is trying to help people reframe the way they are thinking about their lives and giving them an opportunity to choose a different way of feeling about themselves. That's good, and that would fit in with a lot, I think, of what we're trying to do in the world of theology. I take it that as we talk about personal sin, that the people who have wanted to put aside that kind of language have done it for the sake of human beings. In other words, they thought that we would be better off if we put that word sin into the zone of silence and spoke more optimistically and positively about human nature. But I think they went wrong in that. I think they made a mistake in doing that. And that what they did is deny an essential reality about us human beings. That is that we are free, that it is possible to choose good, and it's possible to choose evil. And that sometimes our actions are indeed culpable and blameworthy. And sometimes seriously so. Sometimes we change our fundamental option in life. We go towards evil instead of towards good. We, we opt for selfishness instead of love in our lives. And we know that. At times, that's just a part of our personal experience. In our heart, we know we've gone in the wrong direction. And I think that we have to be able to talk about that, but always in a positive framework of saying, yes, but there's a God who loves us, and there's a more powerful love in the world than all of the sins that we might ever commit. You've been listening to Reflections with your host, theologian Father James Basic, campus minister and assistant professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. Joining Father Basic in this discussion was Dr. Roman Carrick, the director of the Counseling and Career Development Center at Bowling Green State University. The topic of this week's Reflections was personal sin. If you have any questions about today's program or any ideas for topics you'd like to hear discussed, please write to Reflections in care of WLQR, Toledo, Ohio, 43623. Produced in the studios of WLQR, Reflections is directed by Mark Ferguson. Executive producer is Mary Beth Kirshner. Reflections is brought to you by the Genesis Radio Network.